Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Welcome to Getting to Know You. My name is Joe Nash. Today we're going to be talking about the Albany Mummies, the big exhibit down at the Albany Institute. Um, we have with us the executive director and curator of the Albany Institute, Thomas Graft, and we have the public relations and marketing person, um, Anya Nagy. So welcome. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Now this Thank you. This exhibit started in September. It's going till June 8th. I'm going to emphasize it's there till June 8th, so people, there's several months they can still go. But before we talk about the exhibit in general, why don't you tell us about the first couple months now that you're up and running? How has it been going since since it opened? Oh well, well, it's been a uh, wonderful exhibition, and our visitation has um, is more than doubled from last year. I mean, people really like mummies, mm -hmm. and these are the Albany mummies, so that it has a tremendous fascination for all ages. Okay, and um, Anya, you've as a public relations and marketing person for the first three months here it's opened. Have you been busy with all the uh, running We've been that? very <laughs> busy. We've been um, doing more traditional um, ad buys and things and getting response from that but people also are very interested in the lectures that are coming mm -hmm. through so they come back to see the lectures, the um, series. And we've also, if you've seen a mummy around town. We actually have had mummy Ankenfenmut around town at places like Larkfest. No, I have not. And seen. at our mummy birthday party okay. that we held in November. So keep an eye out for him. He um, likes to promote his show. Okay, and it's <laughs> and what are you calling it? Mummy around town. <laughs> he, is, he is a mummy around town. Okay, well, before I was reading that um, the exhibit. The work for this exhibit, getting it together and starting it up, started about seven years ago, but the real story starts over 100 years ago, um, 1909. So why don't we start there? How did the, tell us about the, the original, the mummies that have been there that we all know, but mm -hmm. tell us about the original. Well, um, you know, the Albany Institute was founded in 1791, so the museum has been, uh, it's one of the, it is the oldest museum in New York State, one of the oldest museums in the country. And it had its various offices uh, and galleries in Albany. But then in 1907, the museum decided to build their own museum. And they were getting ready to open the museum with all new exhibitions. And there's a, a man in town by the name of Sam Brown. And he was uh, traveled a great deal. He was very good friends with members of the Board of Trustees. And he said, well, you know, do you want a mummy? Do you want it? Does the Albany Institute, wouldn't it be great if the Albany Institute had um, several mummies and at that time Egyptian mummies were the one of the most significant collections in museum mm -hmm. in other words in, in order to be a real museum oh. at that time you <laughs> needed to have real mummies so okay. uh, Sam Brown went to Egypt he went to the Cairo Museum and the Albany Institute and other museums, other educational institutions were very lucky because the, uh, there a large cache of mummies had just been discovered in, uh, in Egypt. So the Cairo Museum had an abundance of mm -hmm. uh, mummies and coffins. In fact, they discovered 254. So the Cairo Museum kept, of course, the um, kings and queens mm -hmm. and pharaohs and that type of thing. But then they sold to educational institutions, okay. as we will see, uh, Egyptian coffins and, and mummies. And I was reading that in 1909 in Albany, this was actually a big, it was a big, big thing. Then they followed the arrival through the paper every day? And oh, absolutely. I mean, it would be very similar to social media and Twitter <laughs> today. You would, uh, um, there were reporters on board and they gave daily... Re reporters went over to Egypt with... Uh, there were reporters on board of the, the okay. ship, okay. which okay, I so guess so. was, you know, kind of a common thing. Oh, okay. And they were given re giving reports okay. about you know, the status of a variety of things, okay. including the Egyptian mummies, because, you know, it was interesting, it was a novelty, okay. it was fun. So the, the two mummies, which are known as the Albany mummies, they've been there since 1909, so the next step would be, and for all those years you thought it was 
it was um, a priest and a priestess. Is that what you were? Exactly. At the Cairo Museum, when uh, Mr. Brown was negotiating to purchase them for the Albany Institute, uh, he was told that there was one was a priest and the other was a priestess. Okay. And there are two mummies, one from the Ptolemaic period, which was the priest. The 21st dynasty mummy was uh, determined to be a priestess by the uh, Cairo Museum. But how would they mm -hmm. know? I mean. All right, so now then this is the important part. When we had the, when the mummies had been here, they had no lids on them, correct? Correct. So tell, now you just told me this very interesting story about the Egyptologist who lives in Albany. So what was the next step here in this whole big? Uh, we're, we're, yes, the, um, you know, uh, fast forward till 1988, we right. talked a little bit about that, where we did bring the mummies over to Albany Med to do CAT scans oh, and x-rays, right. and we were at that time looking to see if there was ju there were jewelry or amulets or things inside the mummies. So uh, very interesting, that was recorded on ancient ER because they also discovered a prosthetic toe a no, ceramic right, okay. toe, which was exciting, and that made world news. Uh, then the mummies <laughs> are back in, you know, back in their gallery, and Dr. Peter Lacavora, who is a world-renowned Egyptologist, lives part of the time in Cairo, part of the time in Atlanta. He's a curator at mm -hmm. the Emory University. Also lives in Albany. And he was very familiar with our collection, but when he moved to Albany, he started coming and looking and uh, spending time in our collection. He helped us rewrite our labels, and then one day he said, by the way, do you know that the, uh, the lid of your 21st Dynasty coffin is at the uh, museum in Vienna, and the coffin cover is in the museum in uh, in London, the British Museum, and of course we had no idea. <laughs> uh, he was able to read the hieroglyphs. Oh, I mean, okay. that's a key thing. Yeah. When you read the hieroglyphs, yeah. you, it tells you a lot of information about okay. our mummy. And so we, he said, you should do an exhibition to reunite the three pieces okay. of the coffin for the first time in a hundred uh, years. So. That's the current exhibit that we're talking about that here today. Okay. It is the current exhibit, and then um, and once the two museums agreed, then we really went forward with the exhibition. Oh, okay. But Peter also, um, uh, as an Egyptologist uh, with 25 years of experience, said, you know, I think we really ought to take these mummies over to Albany Med and, uh, again. Well, the, the technology has changed, I think, since, tech, yes. since 1988. The technology has changed, and also the research has changed. Okay. There have been lots of examples of uh, mummies, um, you know, being x-rayed and um, uh, CAT scanned earlier, and when you use the new technology, as you okay. suggested, uh, new things are revealed. Okay. And then what were some of the things that were revealed in 2012 that were not revealed in uh, 1988. True. Well, in 2012, we were looking to see if whether it was a man or a woman. Okay. I mean, that was the goal. So uh, there, uh, Peter Lacavora was there, uh, Dr. Bob Breyer, who um, has, is a, also an Egyptologist and a medical doctor was with us in the room and everybody was looking to see what were the salient points. Okay. And the salient points of determining whether you're a man or a woman, if you're looking at 3,000 year old skeleton remains, is uh, the, your, the brow and mm -hmm. a, a man is much more pronounced. There's a bone at the back of the neck that has a very distinctive shape, which is uh, different between okay. a man and a woman. Obviously the pelvic region is, uh, mm -hmm. there are some obvious differences and um, just the overall bone structure. Um, male uh, male uh, bones are just larger and mm -hmm. denser. It's just a different structure. And then I, the whole the whole x-raying was captured on a DVD. If you want to watch this, we have it here in the library. It's called The Albany Mummies. It's fascinating. It tells the whole story of all the x-rays um, mm -hmm. and what they found out and how they found out. So that brings us up to speed. So. When people come down to the Albany Institute, you have it divided up into four or five different sections. What can, what are, when we turn on you here, what are some of the things people can uh, see in the in the current exhibit? Well, the first part when you walk in is a contextualization of what ancient Egypt was um, and when our mummies lived. And they, um, they are, the they were, um, if I remember, they're from a thousand years apart. Right, around. they're from two different time two periods. Different, um, 
well, Correct. What's it, two different uh, dynasties or whatever? Correct. <laughs> um, and so that helps to give some contextualization. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a section that actually focuses on Sam Brown and how the museum got the mummies, that process with some of the items from Sam Brown's collections, his letters back to the Board of Trustees, as well as information about that cash. Um, that the Cairo Museum used as set up as a marketplace to sell the mummies and uh, coffins to the educational institutions this is back worldwide. In 19, back in 1909. Correct. Okay. And then we also go and talk about the Western world's fascination with Egypt, uh, the in the influence of Napoleon going into Egypt, what he was able to discover, uh, for instance, the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, mm -hmm. which is the key to understanding hieroglyphs, which helps really understand what ancient Egypt was like, because, like Tamas said, if you read the hieroglyphs on our coffin, we were able to find out more information about our mummy, and that would not have been possible without the discovery of a piece such as the Rosetta Stone. Okay. And we actually have a full-size Rosetta Stone replica on display right now in the exhibit in that section, so that's a really great thing to see. We have a um, section that will talk about where on Confinement, that's our 3,000-year-old mummy. How do you say that name again? Because I keep reading it on all this stuff here. On Confinement. And you'll have to apologize. Uh, I have to apologize. I have a cold. <laughs> so perhaps it doesn't sound as awesome as it could, but um, we have a room that talks about what his life would have been like um, in the 21st dynasty. He was um, a priest and sculptor, so um, that was actually confirmed in the CAT scans um, as well. Uh, he had an overdeveloped shoulder, mm -hmm. which indicated that the hieroglyphs which said that he was a sculptor, it matched the body that was okay. in the coffin box, so okay. that's pretty interesting. And we have a lot of pieces from, of everyday life, um, which are quite rare if you think about a three, what a 3,000 year old man would have been exposed to. We have those elements on display. Okay. Um, and we also had a um, garment that was found underneath the, um, the mummy's body, um, which we didn't know about until we were moving the mummy. I'm not sure when the um, robe was actually discovered and what moving process, but mm -hmm. it it's very rare to have a piece of linen that old. It was there all those years. And it was years. kind of balled up. No okay. one was really paying attention to it yeah. until um, Dr. Peter Lakavoris <laughs> realized Again. it might have been something <laughs> more significant. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that came to uh, light, and we have that on display as well. Um, um, the international loan pieces, that inner coffin cover from the British Museum, as well as the outer coffin cover from the uh, museum in Vienna are on display. Those pieces are now together for the first time in over 100 years. They're really, it's quite um, dramatic to be in that okay. space and with them. Well, you're talking about some of these pieces. I was reading you have over 200 items on loan from museums all over the world, like the British Museum, the Metropolitan, whatever, can you, I mean, obviously we can't talk about all of them, but what are some of these, um, some of these items? Uh, well, I, they, we have some really interesting to sort of, you know, uh, talk about what Anya said from the Mu American Museum of Natural History in New York. Okay. Um, sort of everyday items, and they not necessarily, they didn't necessarily belong to Ankan Fenmut, but they're a pair of sand, woven sandals. Mm -hmm. There's a walking stick. So these are the are rare survivals mm -hmm. of uh, Egyptian daily life, which I think is very exciting. We have a piece of uh, bread that was, um, you know, be, is saved all of these years, and a bread mold. So these are very rare and unusual things to see. And how do, how does a place? How do you get? You just ask the British Museum, can we borrow this? I mean, how does that work? Uh, well, you know, this is the key is to having a curator, uh, Dr. Peter Lacavora, because, you know, this is his world, yeah. and, you know, he uh, was able to talk to all of these people. Uh, we wrote them letters, and, you know, we started um, compiling the loan list uh, probably about six years okay. ago when, you know, we let people know, because it takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to have all of these loans come. Um, things need to, needed to be conserved and that type of thing. Uh, and then we also got a terrific terrific uh, stone sculpture of Sekhmet, who was a goddess who uh, guarded the temple of Amun where, and the temple of Mut, which is oh, where okay. Akenfenmut uh, spent part of okay. his days. So that's a terrific uh, addition, and that was from the Ber uh, Museum in Berkeley in California. Right, but they're basically, you're saying, they're from all over the world. Yes, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, so over 200 items. One thing, uh, you were telling me, you have these facsimiles of 
the books that Napoleon, could you, you were telling me about that before we started. What, what, tell me about that, because that was very interesting. Um, we have the actual copies. Oh, yeah, of, the actual. Right, the actual copies of um, the books that were published after Napoleon and his army went through Egypt. He also brought artists with him, and they um, did illustrations of what they saw while they were in Egypt. And that would have been in what? That would have been uh, or something, 1799. Oh, okay. Yeah, the expedition was in 1799. The books were published from about 1803 so to these, 1829. So they were doing sketches in 1799, right? In of Egypt. what they saw, oh, okay. right? So they're like mm -hmm. the and they're large volumes, and it has a lot of uh, detail in them, and it has a lot of great information about what they saw when they came through um, Egypt. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. and then this, that was like the photography of the day, I guess. Yeah, um, absolutely. Right. Now, before we talk about some of the educational programs, you you have many lectures from world-renowned. Um, Egyptologists, is that the right word? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, they're the rock stars of the Egyptologists the Egypt world. So far, you've had several. How have they been? A, have the attendance been really good at those? Uh, they've been terrific. Uh, we've had over a hundred people at each of the lectures. Okay. As a matter of fact, it's standing room only for the lectures. So okay. if people are interested in uh, coming, I would absolutely advise you know come a little early, get a good seat. Okay. And we've talked about Egyptomania, the uh, Western cultures fascination with Egypt. Uh, yesterday, Joyce Haynes from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts talked about hieroglyphs and what was on Ankhon Fenmut's coffin and uh, the images of Ankhon Fenmut, which is interesting. But coming up in uh, January 12th, uh, Bob Breyer, Dr. Bob Breyer will be here. And he was the person who was with, who really has um, gone through and x-rayed and cat scanned over a hundred mummies around the world. Okay, he was on, so the, he was on the DVD. Of, he's on the okay. DVD, yeah. He's called Mr. Mummy. That's okay. what he's known And he's going to talk about what he's, he's gonna, learned from right. all his x-rays. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well this, people will be able to watch this show all during January, February, March, and we have a lot of um, upcoming events. That's January 12th. Jan there's, a, there's a couple in January, there's one in February, yeah, several you know, in March. Will these all be on your website? We'll they'll all website. be on our website, and uh, they're just uh, some very interesting. One, lect one person's going to be talking about the reuse of coffins. You think that all the coffins, Egyptian coffins, mm -hmm. were made for the person, and they've been buried all these years, and a lot of times they were uh, uncovered during ancient times and okay. then repainted. But I think the one that will probably draw the most interest will be uh, uh, Ikram, uh, Salima Ikram, who's talking about animal mummies. And she is the world-renowned specialist on animal mummies. Okay, that's, that's going to be Friday, April 11th. And I see that some of your speakers are from the University of, of Liverpool, the American University, Cairo, mm -hmm. UCLA, the British right. Museum. So these are... Uh, like you said before, the rock stars. The rock the stars, yes, yes. And uh, John Taylor, who is the keeper of the uh, Egyptian collections at the British Museum, has been to Albany before, okay. and but he's going to be uh, talking again about Ankhon okay. Fenmu and a variety in, of other things. In the in the mummy world, are the Albany mummies? I don't know what the word is. Are they are they sort of famous in some way, or are they are, yeah. some, are, are, are they? They certainly have a pro <laughs> high profile, and part of the reason they have a, a high profile, they're well documented. The um, ceramic toe, the fact that Ankhon Fenmut has a ceramic toe, okay. there are only two other instances in the world of mummies having uh, prosth a prosthesis. So one, um, uh, one is in Cairo, and the other is at the British Museum. Are they all... Are they toes? Are they and the, uh, well, what distinguishes our mummy from the other mummies is the other mummies are were used during their lifetime. So a toe was fashioned and attached to a sandal, so that when you were walking down mm -hmm. the street, it wouldn't look like your toe was missing. Our mummy has a toe that was seemed to have been fashioned to make him whole to go into the afterlife, right. and that's another belief system of being whole in the afterlife, okay. so you can rise up and enjoy uh, your daily activities. Um, some of the speakers you're having, I just want to ask one quick question here about the mummifying animals. Was it mainly cats, pets, cats and dogs or all? Uh, they weren't pets. 
uh, they were gods and goddesses. Okay. So there are examples of baboons and water buffaloes. Can you imagine a hundred water buffaloes mummified? Yeah. I, you know, it's a very large animal. So, uh, and then there are cats and dogs and crocodiles and birds, mm -hmm. but they're all gods, and okay. that was the purpose. So, for example, we have a, um, a mummy, an animal mummy at the Albany Institute that we acquired from the Metropolitan Museum in uh, the 1950s, and we when we purchased it, it was described as a, uh, a cat. But when we brought it over to Albany Med to mm -hmm. have it x-rayed and cat scanned, it turned out to be a dog. Okay. I, that was also in the, in the DVD. Yeah. yeah. Is there um, some of these other, okay, these, these speakers and lectures go all the way through to the middle of April. <clears throat> so there's all kinds of, um, is there any others you would want to highlight? Um, uh, well, I think I, in, there are, um, you no, know, I think that look, you know, the art. I think it's important to. Uh, the title of this is "Draw Like an uh, an Egyptian," and Egyptian art, for the most part, are in profile. If you look at it, they're uh, the way they've constructed. So I think that's very interesting, and they all really relate to uh, topics uh, related to ancient Egypt and current research that's going on. As you can imagine, scholarship changes all the time. And so we wanted to make sure that we were bringing in the most up-to-date scholarship. I know, is, and one of your things down at part of your, the exhibit is, is um, Egyptian art in the modern world is that part of is that part of the um, one of the part of the um, one of the uh, sections of the exhibit is actually Egyptomania and a lot of that is Egyptian style themes that were incorporated into Western decor oh, okay. or artwork um, whether it be jewelry or furniture or um, having the obelisks within um, uh, park settings, things like that. Um, we have a whole section of how those uh, examples might have been in personal, people's personal collections um, and uh, in public settings. Okay. Well, why don't we talk now a little bit about um, some of the things people can see down there. I see that you have have you been getting a lot of kids down here for this exhibit? Because kids always love. You know, and and then right away in this exhibition, when you walk in there, uh, we have a replica of King Tut's chair, okay. and it's at the top of the stairs. And you can walk up and have you can sit in the chair, so it's interactive, and you can have your photograph okay. taken I, on as a pharaoh or as a queen in Egypt. There's some you things like. you can put on. That make, yes. So right. then that sort of sets the <laughs> stage, and then you can go into the. Um, I see you it, have an interactive mummification station. Yes. So what is? Yes. So you can. There are instructions, uh, and there is a uh, a sculpture of a uh, person, and you can mummify that person with. We have material there. Yep. That mm -hmm. We do. One of the um, elements of our mummy, Ankhon Fenmut, the 21st Dynasty mummy, is he was mummified in a time when um, the economy was poor in Egypt. And so uh, the mummification style that he uh, went through was actually taking the organs out, wrapping them individually, mm -hmm. and putting them back into the body instead of putting them in the canopic jars like other mummies are known to have had done. The jars would be buried with them. Correct. And these, the, they just in this, you put them back oh, yeah. in, okay. and then the elements of those jars, which were the four sons of Horus, are then uh, inscribed on the coffin oh, okay. outside, so that's incorporated. A lot of the materials were put directly on the coffin. So in the mummification station, we have the linen bandages to wrap the body. Mm -hmm. We have amulets that you can put on the body when you're wrapping it. We tell you what they mean and where they can go. And if you, we have a lion table, a replica lion table where that mummification would have happened. And then once you're done, you put it into a coffin and then the next person to come along can do the investigation process, oh, okay. can take right. the body out, mm -hmm. unwrap it, find out and learn about that mummy. And that section is actually um, next to um, a, a place where we have uh, headdresses that people can put on. They can smell scents that would have been put on the body, perfumes that would have been put on the body. So um, it's in, uh, intentionally targeting different sensory experiences. Okay. So I think kids probably like that, right? It's a great, mm -hmm. and you find out very fast that you have to work <laughs> in a team to mummify anything. <laughs> and you have a um, hieroglyph 
hieroglyph station? What we is? do, yes. Mm -hmm. There is a um, section where you're able to slide in hieroglyphs and write your name in hieroglyphs using the alphabet, oh, okay. um, the hieroglyphic alphabet. And we also have a game of Senate, which was a game that was played um, in ancient Egypt. And we have instructions so people are able to um, play as a group um, this game of Senate, which has um, uh, sticks and different oh, okay. pieces that you would move along. Now you were, you were telling me that you've had a lot of school groups in, and you're, we're filming this in January, but you're fully booked till the end of the school year. For how does that work? A whole class comes in, or um, classes come in. We've had classes every day, as far as I can remember, and they've been booking them. Um, and I believe that they are booked through June. Um, we try to get full schools in, full districts mm -hmm. in, um, so that say a full grade level is able to experience the same thing. They are able to go into the galleries, have a guided tour. They also participate in our activities in our art studio okay. when they're there. Well, what do you think? Um, what do you think the fascination is with ancient? You, you said before several times it's in all your promote. There is a fascination with e ancient Egypt as as there is with say Rome and Greece. But what do you what do you think it is about Egypt particularly? Well, I think it's because first of all, it was a very sophisticated mm -hmm. civilization that existed many you know thousands and thousands of years ago, and you know so I think that and because it was discovered, recorded by Napoleon and others, there's a tremendous amount of information that we can learn from this and as I mentioned there's always new scholarship mm -hmm. that is being uncovered by Egyptologists who are continue to work in Egypt Sudan and the air in those areas so and this I think the idea of mummification and the afterlife and rebirth I mean there's a lot of things about it that appeal to people yeah, I mean I think compared to when people study Rome and Greece there is more. There's the, the afterlife thing is is what when you study Egypt that's, that always comes up. Mm -hmm. It seems to be mm -hmm. a lot. Now, what, mm -hmm. was one of your sections is on the is on the afterlife, isn't it? Right, right. And the, in that section, we have the the Albany Institute's other mummy, which is the Ptolemaic period mummy. Uh, and in that, there uh, that mummy is partially unwrapped. And oh, that's the so one I saw on the DVD where it. It stops at the waist or something? Exactly okay. right. And it's very interesting. There's a letter that Samuel Brown writes the Albany Institute, and he particularly asked the director of the Cairo Museum to unwrap that mummy to make sure it wasn't a mushy mummy. Okay. And apparently some of them, you know, if they had gotten wet or something like that, might have been a mushy mummy. But also he thought it would be very educational for people to see how many layers of linen were used to actually wrap a mummy. And this is obviously a very expensive process. Well, you can see in the DVD, if you watch it, the, the, bo the body's laying there. It, it is very thick. Mm -hmm. It's like, right. yes. do they know how many layers that was? Um, I don't know if anybody counted the number <laughs> of layers, but we could. We could, have, we could have a contest about counting the number of layers. And you can see it in the DVD, okay. or you can come to the Albany Institute and, and, and see, see, it it in in the, see it in person. Now, and finally, um, <clears throat> SUNY Press is going to be publishing a book about the whole exhibit. Is that book out yet, or is it? It's still in process, okay. and um, it should be out sometime in the spring. And the exhibit goes through? June 8th. June 8th, which is Sunday, June 8th. And at that point, uh, we will be uh, packing everything up. And but we'll, the two mummies will be staying. The <laughs> two mummies are going to be staying. And we will be reinstalling our um, the exhibition, elements of the exhibition, on the top floor of the museum. And uh, it will be an expanded exhibition. And we will be, a num not all the loans are returning. So oh, okay. a number of the loans will be staying. So that we'll be able to tell a larger story of okay. ancient Egypt. And people can check the Albany Institute's website. There's many lectures from world-renowned world Egyptologists, um, two in January, one in February, two in March, two in April. So please check that. These, there's, like um, Thomas was saying here, one is on the you're saying the mummifying animals are going to be a very popular one. So. I think so. Have I, I left anything so. out? <laughs> No. <laughs> no, I think you did a great job. Yeah, I'm encouraging good. people to come by because even though they are going to remain um, on site, the um, the pieces of the burial, the, specifically the coffin, mm -hmm. are really 
striking to see. And the main, the inner lid, which is actually the face that you've seen around town, um, is on normally thing. on display in the British Museum anyway. Um, so you don't have to go to the British Museum to see it, but it is one of their pieces this, that, this one yes, that one of the pieces see. that they normally have okay. on view. Yeah. All right. And then just one last thing is, you know, there are over 300 objects in this exhibition. So it is in an our, our, in 5,000 square feet. So people, if you've been to the museum and you've seen the mummies on mm -hmm. the top floor, there there are about 70 objects in a, uh, in a very small gallery. So this is a major show with once in a lifetime opportunity to and, see Egyptian artifacts. And there's also several other um, ex exhibits down through the, not just Egypt, but there's always stuff going on at the Albany Institute. Ah, uh, yes. We, uh, we uh, Hudson River School paintings are, uh, will be on view throughout the run of the Egyptian mm -hmm. show. And currently we have an exhibition called Big and Bold, which highlights our contemporary art collection. And that goes till? Uh, that'll be on view until March 2nd. All right, so you can see Mm -hmm. People can go from Egypt to the modern. To world. modern, okay. to the Hudson River, um, uh, Hudson River School landscapes. Okay, so. well, very good. Well, thanks for coming in. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You have several months left. You have till June 8th to see the mummy exhibit down at um, Albany Institute. And we will see you next time on Getting to Know You.